This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Shirts for the Scene. Head over to thepopgoproject.com and you can purchase your favorite band tee. We are raising money for the local artist in northeastern Pennsylvania whose income was drastically affected by COVID-19 since the world shut down all the way back in March of last year. Hard to believe we've been going through this for almost a year now, but that's why this fundraiser is so important. Artist and musician's income has been next to nothing. And by buying a t-shirt on the online store, your purchase will directly have an impact as the proceeds go to the band whose shirt you are buying. There are over 100 bands, artists, and venues to choose from, but the store will be closing at the end of March. So go to thepopgoproject.com and purchase your shirt today. That's thepopgoproject.com and click the link for shirts for the scene. Shirts of the Scene is made possible by Axel Rad Screen Printing in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. Visit them online at axelradarmy.com. My guest today was the Weekender's youngest intern who started when he was 16 years old. For those of you who don't know, the Weekender back in the day was the Bible when it came to arts and entertainment in northeastern Pennsylvania. We talk about how and why he started an internship at the Weekender when he wasn't even finished with high school yet. We also get into some of the experiences he had while he was there, which included interviewing Lewis Black and organizing a charity event with the band Quiet Drive. He was such an ambitious kid, and I'm so proud of him and what he's done with his life so far at the young age of 28. I'm super thankful that the advice that I gave him back in the day actually worked out in his favor and didn't ruin his life. This is The Weekender Files. Welcome to the show, Matt Morgus. And we are live. Live. What's up? Not much. What's going on? Not much. You all right? You nervous? I'm not nervous. I just went over everything that I was kind of going to say. So now I feel like I'm going to repeat myself and leave my own stuff. <laughs> oh, man. Well, today I'm joined by Matt Morgus, who was the Weekenders' youngest intern ever. What? How old were you when you started the Weekenders? I think 16. I just got my driver's license. Oh, my God. What a what a place to start your life. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Morgus. Man, I haven't seen you uh, probably since your 21st birthday. That's right. That's one of the last times I think I was out drinking in Nipa, which was, I'm going to give away my age here, like seven years ago now. Donos. Well, no. I mean, that was, that was 2010, wasn't it? Or no? Oh, I didn't turn 21 until 2013. That was 2013. Why did I think it was 2010? I don't know. I don't know. 2013. Man, where does the time go? I know. Where does the time go? Matt Morgus, a young 16-year-old kid interning at The Weekender. And how long were you there for? I feel like you were around for a while. Yeah, like three years, I think. Because I did it. I I mean, I guess we're going to get into all this. Um, But like, once I got to college at Temple in Philly, uh, it kind of just ended, I guess, at that point because it's too far away. Tried to keep it going, doing freelance, but uh, then I got into the computer stuff and left it behind that's all right but it was a, it was an impactful three years for for a kid your age too i mean like yeah when i say you were an intern at 16 it wasn't like we went out and found you uh at school i think you you approached us so tell tell me a little bit about how that happened because i don't even think i know how that happened right. but i mean how does a 16 year old yeah. kid who's you know supposed to be in in uh, high school and you just got your driver's license you should be like you know, cruising with your buddies, uh, and instead you're you're uh, looking for internships at the Weekender. Well, that kind of happened. I got in trouble cruising with the buddies. I was told, you got to go get a job. Uh, but at the same time, we had a pretty cool assignment in school where we had to go for biology class. We had to go shadow every marking period, so it was like four quarters in a school year. Uh, each one, we had to go job shadow someone, uh, which was the first time I really thought like, oh, wow, you're not going to go play professional sports. You know, like when you're in Little League, you're like – I'm going to go play MLB or whatever, right? And then you actually get to like junior high, high school, and they're like, well, what are you going to do when you grow up? So that was the first time they made me like in like 10th grade or whatever. They're like made everyone really think about it. Like, what are you going to go major in? Or if you go to college or are you going to go to college? What are you going to do? So I was like, shit, I have no idea. So I emailed like 97.9X and like weekender people and stuff like that, uh, just trying to like do my job shadowing somehow around music. No, I wasn't good enough to actually play, but I figured 
all right, like I'm kind of into music and sports. So what could, what jobs could I shadow around those two things? Uh, so I went down the music route first and got the job shadow with uh, Jim Bone, 97.9X was the first one I did. And then I shadowed uh, Alan Stout at The Weekender. And then he led me to another one, Eric Ritter at Windmill. And I kind of just got into this whole world. And he also led me to uh, Gene Smith at Rock Street. So I, I don't know, just kind of got into it from there. Um, so I shadowed Alan for a day, had to write a report about it. Um, and Alan threw me to the staff meeting. When I was at the staff meeting, you guys were talking about weekend sessions and starting it up. And the next day I emailed in and said like, hey, I was kind of interested in that project would be down to like help out if you could. And you guys let me come in and help out. Yeah, I, don't, I don't even remember you coming to the staff meeting. Yeah, I think I was, I was telling you a story before this. Uh, where at the end of it, I tried to like speak up a little bit when you guys were talking about the session thing. And I was like, I just saw this like, you know, concert from a beach in California streamed on Facebook. Like, it'd be really cool if we could live stream those or something. And everyone just like got up and walked away mid sentence. I'm like, no one. <laughs> I was just so like invisible. I was like, am I invisible here? What's going on? Well, I mean, how were you yeah. even introduced to the? I mean, was it? That sounds like it was weird. Yeah. No, I, I don't. I don't know if I wasn't speaking up much or people just didn't care what I had to say. But I thought it was a funny moment. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I specifically remember Steve just getting up and walking away, uh, which was funny. Lelo, same thing, because I was kind of talking to Lelo because he was the one talking about it, and he just got up and went to his desk. I was like, All right, I don't know. So I still, you know, I still carried through and emailed the next day and was persistent about it, uh, which is funny. I was probably some nervous kid. I was scared out of my mind because uh, I was shadowing Alan for the day and he dropped me off up there and then he kind of like disappeared for the meeting. I thought he was going to be there. So then I was just sitting there with all these people. I was in, my mom maybe wear a tie that day for the job shadow. She's like, oh, newspaper people wear ties. And then I he, like, Steve comes over in jeans. You came over in like jeans and a t-shirt. Well, I was wearing jeans. And I'm like, oh gosh, I'm overdressed. I'm this weird kid here. Well, it sounds strange that Alan would have just, <laughs> come up, dropped you off, and then left you. <laughs> well, that was, I don't know if that was his plan or what, what happened there. Um, that, that was a really cool job shadow. So in the morning we did the interview, we interviewed John Kanjar uh, from Nowhere Slow. Mm -hmm. And then in the afternoon after lunch, we, we like wrote the story. So I got to see him like do the interview and put it together. And that was pretty much my only training because I like wrote some stories for The Weekender. And uh, that was the only time I really, I didn't take college class or anything. So like when I did it, it was pretty much like, that was what I had to go off of. I watched him transcribe the thing, add like the bits in and kind of sew it all together. And I was like, all right, so that's what I had to work out of. And then I got better with like training from Mike and everyone else that was there. But uh, <laughs> I kind of had one job shadow. And then as I interned, and got more responsibilities. That's what I had to lean on. I just, I think it's crazy that a 16 year old kid was an intern or, I mean, job shadowing is one thing, but like you became like an official part of the staff almost. Well, and, yeah, know, so I was going to say, once I kind of like realized like, uh, not going to play pro sports, right? I kind of like, you're not, <laughs> you realize you were five foot, like what? Yeah, nine. nine. Yeah. I was going to say that's generous. Uh, and no one else obviously was playing any kind of like college sports or anything like barely D three and stuff. So I was like, okay, this isn't happening for anyone. Not going to happen for me. And that's when I started to get scared to death. I'm just like, what am I going to do? Uh, so that's why I was like, well, I don't even know if I'm going to like that. I don't know how much money's in it. Cause every time you Google, like, anything around those careers like what i really wanted to do was work with soundboard right you know i was looked at the album things when you're a kid like the liner notes and you see like produced by engineered by uh but when you look that stuff up they like make garbage money even when you're doing it for like big bands uh so i was like well let's see what this is about and like see if i can learn it and stuff and that's the thing but like the end of it i mean i was doing sound and like working those gigs and like even doing freelance stuff for papers and getting paid what freelancers do and i couldn't even survive in college so i was like all right i gotta kind of get out of this, this business here <laughs> That's a shame. That's a shame. But, uh, what was cool was that my freshman year of college, and we'll get into this, um, like I was like, I got to find a job down here in Philly. And like having that on my resume, having three years of like legit experience of learning how to email people, communicate, like work with other people on complete projects and stuff was like, put me way ahead of the pack. I feel like it's still uh, moving me up the ladder in my current job just because like I had that experience in the bag before everyone else my age. Morgus, uh, before we get further, um, I'm drying up here, and this is a Weekender uh, Files episode, so uh, I hope you came prepared uh, with a drink. I got Philly Special, Philadelphia Pale Ale. All right. Yards Brewing Company. I'm sure you can get this up there. Yeah, of course. I'm sick with the tried and true Coors Light. Mountain cold refreshment made to chill. Yeah, I went with the uh, four percenter instead of like a nice... Heavy IPA. It's just, uh, it's early. Yeah, it's a marathon today, Morgan. Yeah. It's early. It's early at well, late afternoon. I got to almost grab the second because this is going to go down quick. Uh, but I got it right down the fridge. So I want to grab it quick. 
<laughs> we'll need two. I might need two. I, I brought I brought a backup. I came prepared. This is not my first one. Yeah. But um so I mean you and I don't I wasn't as involved with your work at the weekender as much as like Mike Lillo was. Yeah. But I feel like I remember you doing some pretty cool things. Um, you know, interviewing some pretty big bands, uh, and then having some kind of involvement in uh warp tour. Yeah. So um Obviously, it wasn't a traditional internship. It wasn't like a traditional one where college kids come in for three or six months, write a bunch of stories. And like, it's like a, you know, uh, I emailed Dan and was asking about weekend sessions. was like, I would love to be involved in that project in some sense and like participate somehow. Uh, and that's when Rachel it was like, yeah, sure. Work with Mike on it. It's kind of Mike's baby. And that's where that developed. And then actually that I got into kind of doing more than just that. Uh, was I had an English teacher in high school who had like a wiffle ball league of some kind. And like, I think they raised money for charity or something. And he asked me like, can you get the weekend or write about it? They wrote about it in the past. We got a pretty good turnout after that happened. Uh, can you get him to do it? So when I pitched it to Mike, I think Mike was like, why don't you write it? Or maybe I asked one of went one of the ways. Um, but I was like, all right. So I interviewed the commissioner of the wiffle ball league and wrote up this like wiffle ball story. Uh, and then after that, cause like, I don't think I have Mike ever like assigned me anything. It was always just stuff. Me just like asking like, Hey, this band's coming to town. If I, you know, can I try to get an interview and if I get it, can we run it or something? And like, sometimes he would just run stuff online only basically probably to just keep me busy. <laughs> out of his hair. <laughs> but I'd be like, can I review this concert? And be like, sure. And it would just run online only, but it was awesome. Cause I got to, you know, go through the process of emailing the publicist, getting the review tickets, taking photos, all that stuff. Was that scary for you? Is I mean, like again, you're like a 16 year old kid, and like, yeah, Mike's like, yeah, go contact this person, and and you're you're a kid. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's crazy. like demanding anything. It was always me just being like, hey, this band's coming. A lot of it was honestly me wanting to go to the show without having any money to buy tickets. So I was like, oh, if I write a review and take photos, I get to still see the band. Uh, so that was cool, and uh, yeah, it was a pretty good life hack, I guess, to get concert tickets in high school. <laughs> life hack. You know, now, I, to, I, mean, uh, I was going to say, one of the things I did was that music first stage, which was pretty cool. Uh, the weekend, I was a sponsor for it, a side stage at Montage. Uh, so I'll, oftentimes I was booking the bands. Like Mike would give me the list, say, reach out to these bands uh, for these dates and like schedule them to, you know, told them what time to show up and all that stuff. Uh, announced them, did prizes and giveaways and stuff. And then all that was before the gates opened. So then when the gates opened, I had a little sticker and I was able to go in and saw the, <laughs> several times i was able to bring a buddy that helped out and like whatever and then we got to go into uh so that was pretty cool too like working with the live nation people live nation even then gave me posters to put up and they would give me free tickets to like shows in hershey and stuff in philly i got blink 182 tickets my freshman year here in philly because i put up posters for it <laughs> so it led to a lot of different connections and stuff i feel like you uh probably became pretty popular uh amongst your friends like this is the kid with the the, the ticket hookup uh, I have, I feel like the opposite because normally I could, if I could get anybody, it would be like one person. And then I was probably like the weird obnoxious kid that was like doing this stuff. Like, I don't know. I'm looking back. I feel like I was probably the weird kid. The weird kid doing what? Like real job stuff. Like I wasn't being a kid. I don't know. That's true. That is true. There is that angle. If you want to. Yeah. I mean, there is that. I look at the nerd overachiever. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I mean, you are where you are today because of uh, your uh, your desire to achieve. <laughs> right. Like I had no idea what I wanted to do. I got into video editing. And the reason I kind of got into programming now is because no one knew how to do anything with the website. I remember Lello all the time. was like, oh, I wish the website could do this or that or that. No one knew how to do it. And I remember like going to Temple and I, it wasn't even like one of my like, I don't know. It was one of those gen ed classes. Temple's got, Temple had a really cool pro. He's a plug for Temple. They owe me some money. Uh, well, you were in the sweatshirt, so I mean, yeah, this is a nice sweatshirt. Uh, <laughs> they, they have a really cool program where basically, instead of doing like calculus or biology or chemistry as like your basic gen ed classes, uh, they'll do like chemistry of wine or like sports statistics and stuff. So, like the whole chemistry class, you're just fermenting wine and making wine, uh, or the whole math class, you're just like calculating different sports statistics and being like a money ball GM for the semester. So, they try to do stuff that like gets people interested in the application of those things rather than just like teaching you it. So my science class, I signed up for like one that taught you how to make a website. So the whole semester, you're learning how to make a website. And that counted as one of my two science classes I had to take. And the first day, the teacher was like, you switch your major to computer science, you can be building these websites full time and make a ton of money doing it. 
She was like, I guarantee, she's like, guaranteed a salary and everything, like job before you graduate. Literally walked out and changed my major. I was like, <laughs> I could be a guy, like instead of the guy that edits videos or writes stories or whatever, I could be like some freelance web guy. So it still kind of fit the mold of like what I came out of the weekender from. Uh, and I was like, and no one knew at the weekend or how to do any of this stuff. I could probably make a ton of money doing it just even back home. Uh, so it kind of like led to, you know, everything I'm doing today. That's wild. Did you party in college? I, I mean, I feel like you were always like so focused on your career. Like, did you just, well, once that you... happened, yeah. So I switched my major to computer science freshman year. That's when I like stopped writing stories and stuff for the weekend. I tried to do it, you know, actually it was pretty funny. Uh, I also worked, so the weekend internship led to like a formal summer internship at Go Lock Water, my summer before college, which was awesome because I got a byline on the front page of the Times Leader uh, for a court case I covered. <laughs> Someone spray painted rat on some guy's car and I wrote about it and the times later ran out the front page. Uh, but when I did the internship for Go Lackawanna, Chris Hughes was the editor and he was like, I will email you police blotter stuff. And like, will you put the police blotter together every week? Cause it was like a Sunday paper that came out. So Sunday or Saturday morning, I'd wake up super early, really hung over and write the police blotter. I think he kind of caught on cause he stopped sending them to me. Uh, but I was trying to like, you know, do freelance stuff for Go Lackawanna. And at this point, I was no longer really an intern, but I was like actually paid by the weekend to write some freelance stuff, like album reviews and stuff. But trying to do that with school and then knowing I was not really doing that anymore at the major, I kind of gave it up. Uh, but right away, I was like, I got to find a job now in my field. That's where I'm working now. <laughs> so I got an internship at my current company my freshman year of college, still working there today. Uh, so once I had that, the rest of college was a breeze because they were paying me. They actually paid me for my internship, unlike you guys. Uh, so they're paying oh, good oh, money. Oh, Morgus. So they have to relax. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't on me. So it was like, don't like it. Oh, man, that hurt. Jeez. Oh, my gosh. I was like, wait a minute. Tech, they pay you for your internship? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, and it, was like, it was like 25 bucks an hour or something. I was a freshman in college. Wow. I was That's rich. pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, you're rolling. Yeah. So, and then that just continued. So then, yeah, I got to actually really party. Like when I, when we, you know, when everyone turns 21, no one has money for the bars. But I was like. You're rolling. Shots? Yeah. One dollar beers? Let's go. <laughs> Just so you know, Morgus, I did an internship at the Weekender also, and I did not get paid either. So let's, let's pump the brakes a little bit. I remember uh, going down to Philly, right, and like thinking, okay, different media market now, bigger media market. Am I going to have to start from zero? Like, are the three years I just put in at the Weekender like basically going to not mean anything like down here now? Uh, and I was very concerned about that because like a lot of people, like I was talking to seniors and stuff. You know, they do the orientation. And they're all like, oh, yeah, I'm working for CBS Philly right now. And they're paying me $8 an hour to, like, run the camera. And I'm like, what? And then over here, they're like, oh, we paid 25 an hour for your internship. I was like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> it's crazy how, like, tech obviously has an absurd amount of money. Uh, and that's pretty much what it is. I have no interest in programming, no interest in actually making websites. But it was just, like, a money grab pretty much. And, like, I'm okay at it. So it worked out. And what exactly do you do now? I, I'm on a clinical data processing team uh, for a company that publishes a ton of medical info. So we publish like medical journals, textbooks, and like we write a bunch of, I work in like the, the department of the company that makes that info available, like actual doctors and pharmacists and stuff. But again, boring tech job, pays the bills. Not really. I, so I also like freelance and like build websites and stuff outside of it. Obviously a lot less the last year or two. As you get older, I feel like there's little side hustles die down a little bit uh yeah, that's I mean, where like the fun projects come in i feel like yeah i mean like you get older and it's like is this really worth my time that's what it is yeah yeah because you're married now too like oh my like it's crazy to think about you know matt morgus as a 16 year old kid to like matt morgus now it, well yeah it was, uh i wasn't gonna say that but i was gonna say uh sprout it up uh so the, the freelance stuff definitely has died down since the marriage <laughs> Happened. That's what they'll do to you, man. But they'll, I think that's what happens, right? They'll, they'll crush your spirits. <laughs> well, it's, it's just kind of more like, oh, I'd rather hang on the couch and drink wine uh, than sit at my computer for three more good, hours. Good cover. Oh, good yeah, cover, yeah. Morgus. I, I, I taught you well. Uh, but I was going to say, I do remember you specifically telling me not to get a girlfriend in college. Like, really giving me the lecture before I went down. Uh, and I actually remember hitting you up when we started dating. And you're like, how old are you now? Uh, I told you, you're like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> well it's funny because like you i remember you like talking about college and i i was adamant about yes like i said do not wife up 
your first or second year of, of yeah. college. I said, enjoy it, have fun. Like, I'm not saying go around and, and, you know, be a womanizer by any means. I'm just saying, there's, you know, just there's so much about college that you can be experienced, but like, and not that women, this goes for females too. This is not just a male oriented thing. This is like, I don't believe a, a female should, you know, you know, get tied down early just because like, it, it's just, it's just human nature. When you meet somebody, you, you you kind of focus on, on, on them and you spend your time with them and you know, you just kind of, not that you forget about friends, but it just, it just, it's just different, you know? It is. It is. I know there was a guy, my roommate fresh for year, dated a girl first two, three years. I broke up like right at the end of college and like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to name names. I feel like I'm already giving away too much info for my friends. <laughs> I mean, no, but I mean, this. yeah, you spend three years of, you know, and you're looking back at that, man, I wasted my, you know, my good years of college. You know, you probably party less. You probably, you know, hang out with friends less. You're probably just like, I always like, you just, those experiences are just like <clears throat> on the fly. Like you never know what's going to happen. It just like things are, are just so, uh, I don't know. That's hilarious. I remember sitting around freshman year specifically discussing this and giving my friends the same advice and them countering with, especially the guy that dated the girl, like after college, where else do you meet someone? Like you're left to bars and that's it. And they're like, at that point, all the good ones are taken. I was like, (laughs) (laughs) it's amazing that we think that way. Like, Oh my God. Like there's, I mean, I met my wife. I was four years, yeah. Four years into my three or four years into my, into my career. There's time. But, yeah. you know, looking back at that, the kid you're talking about, I mean, like, I mean, like I said, he waste not wasted. I don't want to say that. I mean, everything's an experience. Yeah. Everything is a, a learning experience. But I mean, I remember you reaching out to me too, saying like, hey, I met this girl. She's really great. And I, I remember, you know, asking you like, well, how old are you? What year are you in now? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I mean, if you didn't have fun in your first two years, like you're not going to have fun. Like just, just end it now. Oh, yeah. But it worked <laughs> I mean, it kind of worked out. We're together now. Uh, it was classic. Yeah. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> I hope so, buddy. You're married. I mean, we've been, we literally got married uh, two weeks when the world shut down. So scheduled at the end of March and mid-March, everything shut down. So we've literally been married just about one year now of COVID times, which I feel like there has to be some equation of like one year COVID times equals two or three years of normal marriage, something like that. Especially well, you're right the code, Morgus. We're in a tiny, tiny, tiny row home in Philly too. Uh, both working at home on Zooms all the time. It's been a fun fun first year i mean if you can make it through that but i think you're set i know that's what i've been saying right yeah things go back to normal should be yeah, and then you i mean you got married and you didn't spend a ton of money yeah we gotta figure that out uh because our we we, had, we rescheduled it for march of this year that's not looking too good no i wouldn't <laughs> count on that unless you're outside but march outside it's not gonna work that's not gonna work nope so uh yeah i don't know what we're gonna do uh there's downfall right because you don't have the big ceremony you don't get all the the wedding family wedding money that normally comes in friends and family yeah but you're not spending the money more because that's the problem see see when you have a wedding right and people don't know this so like see, this is the advice that i got uh, when i was 16 at the weekend and that put me also put me ahead of other people yes <laughs> <laughs> let's go we'll share it with everyone no so when you have a wedding right <clears throat> typically and then the rule of thumb is you know the 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 guest is it, and most don't know this the guest should give you a gift that covers the cost of their dinner. Yes. That's the, we've, I heard that and we were right. realizing that's not the case for a lot of people. Well, the thing is not everyone knows how much these, this shit costs because, yeah. you know, back in the day it was cheap. It was 25 bucks a plate. You know, a couple can give you 50 bucks and they covered their meal, right? No, no. I mean, now it's, it's 130, 140, 150 open bar. Like, it's it's a it's a huge expense, and yeah, you definitely don't make your money back. Not that that's what it's about, but that we were praying like, are we going to break even on this? How does this work? So yeah, that's the debate now. So we're like, do we actually just reschedule this thing again, or should we just like throw our money into a house of some kind? I don't uh, know. We got a debate, man. We got like, I'm into living in the city. Here's She's my recommendation: the suburbs with a yard and a fence. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. I got to take a train to work instead of walking. Uh, so that's the next big decision. I don't know oh, if we get advice on that one. Well, I mean, you don't have a choice. That's what marriage is. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just say yes, whatever you want, and move on with your day. No, but I, what I would recommend is, you know, I would say do it 
at back home in northeastern Pennsylvania. Do it outside. Get it catered. Get a get a and I this will we'll get into this. Get it um, like catered by like um, like a barbecue guy. Right. Yeah. I wonder if anyone knows anyone. You know. I don't know. So, <laughs> no, but I mean that's the way to go. Or or go to a like a what do you call it? Like a PAV. Like yeah. a, they have like it's cheap. They rent it out for the day. It's cheap. There's like a you know you can get a a covered building or a covered outside pavilion. Yeah, that's the way to do it. It's cheap. That's because that's the thing. We already had a small because it was so expensive. Like you said, we had to cap it and uh, only invite certain people. I don't know. It's a mess. But we're not obviously not the only ones that are going through it. Could be a lot worse though. Uh, we luckily just didn't have to spend a lot of money. That's the worst that happened for our. 2020. So. You're rolling though. I mean, you're making that big tech money. You just said it. So open your, open your pockets up and let's go. Yeah. No, I mean, again, it, uh, it sucked, but it just, I don't know. I'm trying to keep it in perspective because I know people are, people are hurting these days. Well, the wedding industry is hurting Morgus. Don't you want to help support them? My gosh. They've been, don't be so selfish. Dude, the, the venue just like didn't, uh, we'll give it away, but they just haven't, they've been like seven months just completely ignoring us now. <laughs> we just, I don't know if they're like really? out of business or what. Uh, yeah, I mean, people on like their Instagram, you know, like they'll post every once in a while on Instagram and the comments are just like, you ever going to call us back? Da, 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 da. So uh, I can't even imagine. I mean, especially down here with, uh, I think we're a little bit more restricted than up your way. And I don't think I've been able to even do many outside events like over the past few months. So I can't imagine. Yeah, what's it like in Philly? So indoor dining just opened up again. So I've seen a lot of uh, some restaurants. I don't know. It's weird. Uh, we have some restaurants around us that just kind of like, I don't close for good, but haven't opened up. They're just like, we're going to be on hiatus for a bit uh, once it got cold and they couldn't really do the outdoor dining. So I don't know. It's, it's kind of dead. Not really. It's one of the debates we have. I don't know about you guys, but I've been like this programmer working from home this whole time. And now don't know if we're ever going to have to go back to the office. So Without all the conveniences of the city, this is the first time we're like thinking suburbs it might make sense, but then who knows? This summer everything can go back to normal and well, yeah, and that's one thing you gotta you gotta think about too, because that's what everyone's doing. I mean, that's everyone was fleeing New York City to, you know, uh, you know, the the suburbs and, and and I don't think that that's ever gonna be the same. Not for a long time, anyways. Yeah, I mean that's what uh that's our debate. I'm like, if I don't ever have to go back to the office, then yeah, let's go get a big place because we're always home. Uh, but if I got to commute again, <laughs> the suburbs here, you got like an hour train ride into the city. Yeah. Uh, two hours a day. I don't know. I'm not ready for that yet. That's a, that's a big decision. Cause that's, I mean, as you get older too, I mean, the last thing you want to do is spend an hour or even two there and then another hour or two home. That's four hours of your day. Just like, I mean, thankfully we have like technology where you can have, you know, your phone and, and get work done. That's or whatever, what people but, do. Yeah. yeah it's, normally it's like no more than an hour train ride. So it's probably like two hours a day. Yeah. But like, what? Or, yeah, but some people that haven't, oh, that's, I don't want to get too far on a tangent here, but yeah, some people got like 20 minute, 30 minute train uh, drive to the train or to the train station, then an hour train ride. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's weird because uh, we've pretty much proven for the past year we don't need to really physically all be together, but I do miss some of it. Like, I feel like there's a lot more formality to talk to people now. Like, even me and you now. It's just like, oh, we got to get on a Zoom, et cetera. Like, that's how it is at work. You know, and normally you just turn your chair around and talk to someone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been <clears throat> in an office since June. So I, I don't know what that's like. Thank just, God, too, because the first three months were, or two, two, two or three months, it was, it was tough, man. Yeah. What was it like working from home with a kid? Cause uh, I got coworkers that have to do it. I don't have to. And they're Dude. Seem, struggling. Um, it's a it's a battle because like you're still expected to do work, right? And then you have this tiny human that you have to make sure doesn't jump off the couch and break their neck off the table, the coffee table, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it just it's 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 weird, and I feel very terrible for like the 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 mom the moms and dads, and I don't know how it works because you know these kids who are doing virtual learning, like how does that work? You know, with a mom and a dad who, you know, both have to work. Like, who 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 teaches their kids? Who stays home with the kids? And then you think about like a, a single mother who has to work. You know, who the same thing? Like, how does it how does it work? I have no idea. Yeah, I'm very thankful that um, my, my kid's in daycare and he still attends daycare because uh, my wife 
and I both work. Um, but I don't know what we would do otherwise. I have no clue. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. I've, uh, I've like looked into some jobs that are remote only, and I never really like pulled the trigger. Right? I'm pretty, pretty happy at my current gig. I don't want to say anything like that. Uh, and it kind of got a taste of it now. And I'm like, if people say this isn't really working from home, but I'm like, I don't know. Something about that office life that first few months, I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I just put my head down, get my stuff done here without anyone like bothering me. But now after a year, I'm like, boy, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the office that like you just miss out on after a while. Yeah, it's definitely not the same if you're if you're home. <clears throat> maybe yeah. I would have maybe I would have enjoyed it more if I was just home by myself. But even then, like, oh God, yeah, I'm very social. I like I like people. Like I like well, I like most people. Yeah, yeah no, I shouldn't say that. I hate most people, and like some. <laughs> I was gonna uh, say that could be a good segue into uh, like I've heard talk about on other podcasts, uh, just like the team environment that was at the weekend. Uh, like what's Lelo call this out too? I guess. Uh, I keep in touch with the most people from that, even though I was still so young that I do from any, like I've had so many people come and go on my current job that like, I don't know, Facebook friend, maybe here and there, but like never really reach out or see them or anything. Uh, in fact, I've got like several contacts still, you know, close friends. Like it says something about like the camaraderie about it. I don't know. Yeah. I feel like <clears throat> at the weekend or there was, I mean, we always had the right, the right people in place and like even when we didn't those people didn't last long i mean i know there's probably three or four people that i can remember that uh joined the team and it was like how did you even get get here like how well, did you make it past the 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 gate because you're not going to work here this is something i kind of wanted to bring up because uh when i was there i thought everyone was one big happy family everyone loved each other it was like this awesome environment and then when Lelo left, that was kind of the first time I heard like there's a lot of inside drama there that I was not really aware of, I guess. Uh, and then listening back to some of these, I'm like, holy shit, maybe I mean, I guess that is kind of like a family, right? Every family's got like issues and stuff, but like, yeah, funny you say that about certain people that didn't quite fit in and stuff. Cause to me, and I'm sure the people on the outside that weren't necessarily working there thought everyone was one big cohesive group, almost like a little click you got it going on. And we, we were, we were for the most part. It's um it's it's weird. Uh, it, it was it was a family, like you said. I mean, people just we would fight like family because we were around each other all the time, and it was like it wasn't like a big company where like I would see you, you know, on a Monday and then not see you again until you know next Friday. Like I would see we'd see each other every single day, and like the staff, like what ten maybe. And I feel like well. Yeah, I feel like maybe because everyone's so close, I light up some of those moments, right? At my current job, there's never been any uh, int- as intense things like that because no one really gets too close to one another, I feel like. But yeah. there's also a lot of like after hour things, you know, going to bars, weekend events and stuff like that that you typically do with friends that you had to do for work. So I guess that kind of led to, I would imagine. Friendship. Yeah, like and we were, we, were, you know? we were friends. I mean, I, and I, I think, you know, more people drifted apart after the weekender was over than we did like during it. Like, we were always just so close. And yeah. Cause I was going to say the flip side of it is that uh, like, I still go to a show every summer with Lalo. Obviously we still chat a lot. Uh, still work with Chris Hughes a lot, like throughout any time I pretty much need any, just like actually you were putting together, maybe it was the shirts for the scene or whatever. You're like, who do you use for vectors? And I was like, I still use Chris. Like Chris does a lot of illustrations and stuff for me. Uh, I host Rich's website, which, constantly is falling over because like the traffic is like this and then every once in a while goes up and tips the server over so he's texting me like once a week telling me to restart it reboot it uh but yeah it's kind of crazy just how like how much i'm still in touch with people or even people we worked with there didn't directly work with at the weekend there compared to i don't know hundreds of people i've worked with here in philly that i'm not anywhere close to like yeah i think that's that goes to, to along with um you know it being your first gig and your first i, I don't know I'm in my opinion, anyways. Yeah, like, because I did, I did think that. Like, once, uh, once I started working down here, I was like, maybe I shouldn't be as like close to everyone. <laughs> I, mean, I was like 16. You guys were my friends. <laughs> well, there, it, well, here's the thing too. Like, you know, when you're when you're single and you know just so involved with it, it's 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 easy to kind of immerse yourself into that life, whether it's you know the people you work with or, or the job you're actually doing. And it's easy to go above and beyond and work Saturdays, work at night, all that kind of stuff. But then you get older, you get married and you have kids. It's like, well, 
I mean, this is this is more important right now, right now. Like it's my wife's more important than, you know, working on a Saturday. And, you know, my kids obviously more important than working at night and, and things like that. So it's it's things change. It's it's funny how and that's why I told you, you know, in your first couple years of college, I said, just have fun, man, because you don't get those years back. You don't. And I'm not saying it's not a knock on people who, you know, fell in love freshman year and are happily married today. Like I mean, it does happen. I think it's very rare. But I mean, you you don't get those years back. Yeah. One thing you don't get back in life is and it's time. Uh, one thing that just dawned on me was uh, so got I so mentioned I got involved in sound, uh, and I was actually the Van Gogh gadget, which would play me for every once in a while. Yeah. I would sound for them down here, uh, and again before I was twenty one. So I was getting into like some of the biggest bars down here, Philly Fieldhouse, Mad River, uh, on like Friday Saturday nights. I wasn't actually like doing sound. I was just setting their stuff up and tearing it down. So through the whole time, I was able to go to the bar, get the band discount, all the beers and everything, drink before I was 21. Uh, and I feel like all that, like that was when it switched. When I was in high school, I was like the overachiever nerd. In college, I was kind of like the kid that knew how to get some alcohol because I had some money. I had like hookups to get into the bars. Like when <laughs> I remember some, some of that sneaking my friends in. Uh, I feel like I learned all those shenanigans from uh, my three years. <laughs> and if you were if you were wifed up, you probably wouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had some good times because uh, I remember there were times like uh, I don't want to call him out, but a certain drummer friend of ours would let me just carry his drums to the door, and then I'd get into like the jazz cafe at night for the night to see a band. Play. I have no idea who you're talking about. Not a clue. Not <laughs> one. There was a yeah a special Nirvana show one time that I like helped set up, and then I was just whoop, inside for it. <laughs> Put all the tricks away to anyone else yelling yeah, listening to this. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I feel like you um, interviewed, I think I may, may have already said this, but I think I may have done some research on you. I'm not going to lie to you. Hey, but, it's still uh, out there? Like, I can't find any of my own stuff. Uh, not, there's some old YouTube videos. Which is, I find well, there's, there's some of that, but I feel like you interviewed Train. Yeah. Um, Lewis Black. Lewis Black was a fun one. I mean, those are like, you're a young kid and you're yeah. interviewing these big, huge names. Like, uh, so yeah, I mean, Train was, was one of the lead singer. It was like the bass player or the drummer or something, right? So like it was somewhat underwhelming but cool at the same time because they had Hey Soul Sister on the radio at the time. So I really knew that song. Uh, we're playing Montage. So obviously a big deal too because people are, enough people are coming to see him for that. Um, but yeah, Louis Black was cool because that was one of my, and that's the thing is like a lot of the stuff was like, like I interviewed Blink, Tom from Blink-182, which was kind of like the goal, right? It was like, I just pretty much wanted to use this to talk to my favorite musicians, I guess. Uh, but Lewis Black is one of my favorite comedians. So when he was coming, I like begged low. Like, is anyone going to interview him? Can I do that one? Just told me to go for it. Got the reply back. And like, that's when I kind of realized, like, I don't know. It's kind of the inside, I don't know, inside story behind a lot of this stuff. Because he was like screaming, doing his rants. And then he'd be like, was that one all right? You know, what did we do it? Like, was that funny enough? And I was like, oh, like it's all an act, right? Like it's not, he's not just like this angry grump, right? <laughs> having a heart attack every day with every issue that comes up. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It was kind of, you know, they say, don't meet your heroes and stuff. And like, there was definitely some of that when you interview some of these people, because someone's a jerk or whatever, that it kind of like changes your perception about it. Um, but you also realize like, they're not, they're not all living glamorous lifestyles, right? Like I interviewed a lot of these people that were coming to like smaller clubs or like the cultural center or something. And they're rolling through on vans, like eating Taco Bell, like, you know, counting the money and cash they're getting from the venue to like putting the gas and stuff. And I'm like, holy shit, like these people are on the radio and stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're rolling it. And then if you want to work for a band like that, like those merch guys, sound guys, they were getting pretty much jack shit. And I kind of opened my eyes to like, oh, wow, this is uh, not as glamorous as I guess I thought, which was pretty much the whole goal, I think, of the internship and stuff, was to try to get exposed to these careers and see if like that was something I could do. Uh, so I think it succeeded. Yeah, it's pretty cool that your high school kind of pushed you in that direction because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't think it's wise for us to push, you know, for society to push kids who are 18 years old into uh, college and, and force them to decide, hey, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. I, when I, this was probably the best school assignment I had because I remember him saying, giving a statistic that said like 92% of college freshmen change their major by the time yeah. they don't they finish graduating with a different major than what they started with 
So he, and this again, this was biology class that made us do four job chats before I recorded that. So I feel like this teacher knew like biology is not necessarily the most important thing. Getting these kids in 10th, 11th grade thinking about what the hell they're going to do in two or three years was like the goal. And it did, it worked. I mean, like I had put no thought into it and was basically ignoring it, maybe confront it and then find like some cool, you know, gigs around town that I might be interested in doing it. And kind of made me realize like, I remember Jim Bone, this stuck out too. Jim Bone's like, what's your favorite subject? And I was like, probably like math or science. He's like, dude, math or science is your favorite subject. Get the hell away from here. Like he was like, go as far away as you can. He was like basically selling me on not doing the job. He's like, I wake up at four in the morning. I got to go to bed by 8.30. If I fall asleep at 9.30, I'm miserable. Like I can't go out and see any friends at night. Like I'm always tired. And like, just like, I'm thinking like this guy's morning radio show, listening to him all the time, hilarious. And he's like, don't do this stuff. Like if you like math and science, go do something else. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I've obviously worked with a lot of radio guys and they love what they do, but they're also like, if you could do something else, do it. I, is my kid? Like, oh, yeah. It? I, it was funny. He was like, here's some like 16 year old kid who's like interested in math and he wants to like be a morning radio guy. He was like, no, no. Uh, so I remember like thinking like, why the hell is this guy doing this? Like, this is totally what I would do. He had a big soundboard in front of him. I'm like, you don't have to work that thing. You got to be a genius. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like eventually, like I said, I kind of got into it more and saw like a lot of those sound guys and stuff aren't really making a whole lot. Even the ones like, uh, there's a guy down here in Philly that I interviewed for the weekender and he recorded like title fight, Tiger's Jaw, stuff like that. Uh, and like in the interview, he was telling me like how much in debt he is because of the studio and like how a lot of this stuff is like, he's slowly like paying it back off to like get to the point where he'll own all the equipment and stuff. And like, he's not leasing it anymore and stuff. And I was just like, holy shit, like. Yeah. So like really do this and like work with even those type of bands, like it takes a lot of investment, a lot of equipment. And, you know, unless those bands have like a big record label behind it, they don't have a ton of money to throw at you for it. And <clears throat> speaking about bands, you uh, organized a benefit at the Woodlands with the band Quiet Drive, who I'm a big fan of, right? And oh boy, what, a le- what lessons came out of that? Yeah, let's talk about that because I was, again, I had no involvement in that other than uh i think i helped announce a band uh, the night of the show um that's because you were the only person there uh yeah me and matt chimileski <laughs> there's pictures so, to prove it yeah same with AJ. But, uh, so quiet drive had a, a huge hit i think it was 2006 they covered time after time um i think you did this in 2010 to a 17 year old kid booking a band that has song on the radio was a, a big deal but they had song on the radio who wouldn't want to come out to see him uh, turns out no one. Who, uh, well, you, all right, so you organized this benefit. Who was the benefit for? Or what was the benefit for? So, uh, one of the things that Rachel had, Rachel was the GM, right? And I was like, she was the one I emailed saying like, hey, I'd be interested in working on this project. So when she brought me in, saying like, you could work on sessions. She brought the music first thing, I think. Uh, and she had said like, they do a cystic fibrosis benefit, uh, I think at the Jazz Cafe. She did something where I worked with her at one point, we booked a ton of DJs. That was like one of the first things they did. She gave me like a list of DJs and their phone numbers. Like call them, see if they can do this other benefit. I forget what the cause was for. And she suggested like, after you help me with some of these benefits, you should like maybe do your own. It's like, cool. So, uh, you know, local pizza place guy, uh, owner of the local pizza shop where my family would get their pizza every Friday. I had a daughter with this uh, disease called Rett syndrome. So instead of just doing like general american red cross or whatever i was like oh let's do this like that's something no one really knows about like they have a whole foundation or whatever so that's what i picked as my benefit thing and she told me that like if you're gonna go local bands i think she said you gotta get like a ton of them. like you gotta get like 10 of them on a thing or whatever and like have a bunch of them because they only each draw you know so many people uh to make it work so then she said the other option is like you could get a bunch of sponsors and like pay for a band and me being an ambitious, like, cocky kid was like, yeah, let's like, everyone's doing benefits with local bands, whatever. Let's like go get someone that like national. So I remember email all these booking agents. They're emailing back, like, have you ever done the show before? I'm like, no, I'm gonna never hear from them again. So they were one of the only ones that actually replied to me and like negotiated them, whatever. So it's pretty cool, though. I mean, I had to go around a bunch of businesses, going around time after time, asking if they were interested in sponsoring. You probably know how this goes, being in sales, where people tell me, like, yeah, come back tomorrow. I come back the next day, they're not even there. And then I kind of go, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Checks in the mail. So, but I did. I mean, I raised, like, I think, like, 
four thousand. I raised more money in sponsorship than I raised from the concert, obviously from like ticket sales and stuff. But made enough to cover the bands, cover their flights, so they came in to essentially pay for play for free, right? Like that was kind of the goal. It was like they have no expense, and then all the money we make from the ticket sales was there. So I got enough. I don't know enough sponsorship to cover sound, cover the bands, cover their flights, which was cool. The Woodlands was nice enough to donate hotel rooms, and they charged me one one cent to rent the ballroom. And literally when we were there setting up, the woman came and like tried to collect the thing. She's like, you need to sign this thing. And it's literally one cent. I was like, I'm gonna die. I gave him a gave dollar. Like I thought it was a joke. Uh, so yeah, I mean, lots of, lots of lessons learned about just that industry promoting, like how just to like be with money, talk to people, reach out, cold call, I mean, all that stuff came into play. Uh, so I wouldn't say it was a failure in that sense where I learned a lot, but like the concert itself was a pretty big bust. Yeah, nothing's a failure. What is, what's that saying? Um, the failure as long as you learn something. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, dude, I had a, I was, you know, mentioned I freelance and build my own websites. Uh, and I was doing like a first big project, like five figure contract kind of thing on my own outside of work. Uh, and the sh- <laughs> basically went a little too ambitious because I sold them on like, yeah, I have my own business. This is what I do. Da, 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 da. So they were like, this wasn't like building a website for you or someone who like, I can eat. If I send you a text message with a screenshot of like what I'm building at 10:30 at night, you're not going to get upset. Right. They were like normal business working nine to five, and I'm working nights and weekends on the shit. So they're sending me stuff all day. Can we get an update on this? Da, 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 da. I'm like, holy shit! It was stressful. Like, try to do that with a full time job, and it just took me way longer. I told them like, oh, this would be done in five months, maybe six months tops. And like ten months later, the site was like this whole they wanted this whole like warehouse management system. It was like a whole big thing. Like ten months in, we were like maybe halfway done. And they're like, what is going on here? And I mean, I kind of just rolled on my sleeves, like finished it, got it through, ended up continuing working with them for like a couple more years. But like, I was constantly during that time looking back on that concert and just being like, you know, that sucked, got through it, you know, da 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 da. I'm like, this sucks now, but like, we'll get through it. And like, you learn from it. And that was going through my head then was like, I don't think that concert was a failure. I don't think this was a failure because I learned what I can take on, what I can do, et cetera, how to work with like these clients in the future. And like, I don't know. All of it again, just because kind of like I got a head start working at a real company instead of like flipping burgers or whatever else. Yeah, I mean, one thing I want to ask you was: wasn't there some kind of weird request that the band had with like some kind of like socks? I don't remember this at all. Oh boy, I I, 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 I think I remember hearing like they they wanted like a pair of like I, you know what? Now that you're saying this, I feel like they sent a rider yeah like ridiculous shit and i remember like will beekman maybe or maybe tom del vecchio someone from like that actually promoted shows for real i remember bringing this up to them and they're like oh my gosh they're like we just cross all this stuff out or we just never do it and i remember actually asking one of the band's managers like is this really expected and they're like no no one ever does it and i was like oh thank you like they were like i think that was kind of just like giving me a break as a kid and they were just like no you don't have to stress about this <laughs> <laughs> but i actually now you're saying this i do actually remember rachel reading that stuff be like there's yeah. no freaking way i'm signing this contract with all this in it and then me ask i think that's when i asked the manager I'm like yeah you could just strike it all out it's fine <laughs> that's funny <laughs> no but you learned a lot i mean i feel like there's there's some of the stuff that you're saying like you learned more than i did as a 25 year old at 16 17 I, years old so at temple we have uh, two college graduations because it's such a big school uh they have one giant ceremony where every year bill cosby would speak until my year because he was in jail uh, <laughs> we got Kevin Nagandi from ESPN, Temple grad. Uh, so they have one giant one where they fill the uh, like the basketball arena with everyone, and they have like the keynote speaker, but they don't call everyone's name because that would be ridiculous. So they have like an hour ceremony, or whatever. Then they break you off the next day or the day before, depending on who your major is, and like they have like all these small auditoriums around campus. Like you just go for your major, and that's the way. Of a separate ceremony. Where literally the whole ceremony is them just calling names. And like my major had like a couple hundred people. So it took forever for them to get through it. So most people just go to the big one with the keynote speaker and they speak, they skip the one where they call your name and you walk across the stage. Uh, so I skipped mine where they call my name to meet a potential client at this like coffee shop over here. And like that's why I like signed like to build a website for like 10, 11,000 bucks instead of coming to my college graduation. I kind of remember being like, I would never be able to do this. And the weekend or stuff. And like being able to like make those sales calls and everything. I was cold calling all these people around here, like letting them know I build websites was, you know, had time to do it and stuff like that. And I never would have known how to engage those people if it wasn't for like the experiences I had there. 
So it all paid off. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, even still, I know uh, we hire kids. We have this program at my work now where we hire like 30 to 40 new college grads, like fresh out of college grads every year. They're blown away by just like the corporate email stuff, you know, or like having to book a meeting to like talk with people and stuff like that. Like they're like, oh, how do I do this? Uh, I was able to jump right in, like calling a meeting with other people, like setting up time like that and like to actually discuss a topic and have an agenda and like get something done. Like I didn't have that learning curve, I guess, that a lot of, I see a lot of other people going through. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, again, just gave me a huge advantage, I feel like. I mean, I loved, I loved your ambition. <laughs> that was always something I admired about you as a, as a young kid. Do you remember the time we, uh, you and I, <laughs> you and I went and saw Angels and Airwaves? Yeah, that was like, what I interviewed Tom for. <clears throat> yeah, so I didn't know that. I'm, I'm jealous of that moment. Because, yeah. um, uh, I, you know, if you email Blink's publicist, they never get back to you. But he was putting out this, that Angels and Airwaves movie. And Angels and Airways publishers sent out a thing like this movie's going to be in theaters. Da, 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 da. If you're interested in talking to Tom about it, you know, email me. I don't know, holy shit. I was on vacation, I believe, with my parents like a couple weeks before college and got that, set up the interview on vacation or whatever. And then, yeah, I remember like being like, well, now I got to go see the movie because uh, I just interviewed him about it. The movie kind of sucked, if I remember correctly. Um, <laughs> That's some dude in space alone and gets trapped out there. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great, but like I mean, <laughs> what I remember more about that 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 day or night or whatever it was um, was the the time that we you and I spent at Johnny Rockets because I couldn't drink a beer. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> so you were under exactly age. now we were going to a bar or something. I assume but. you and I went to Johnny Rockets, Rockets, and that was my first time ever there, and. It was bizarre. So, like, you're 10 years younger than I am, right? <laughs> so, like, I feel weird just the fact that you're, like, probably what? Like, I was probably 18, yeah, 18 or 17. Uh, so, I'm 28. You're 18. <laughs> this seems weird. And uh, we're at Johnny Rockets, and they're, they're squirting, like, happy faces on this yeah. plate and ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I actually remember uh, also we did a weekend session at Harvey's Lake. And we went to, I think it was Grotto, right? And you and Matt Chimoweski, Tommy had a properly poor beer, which I need to pour another one here. Uh, you know, you tilt the glass, whatever. And I remember going to my first college party where there was like a keg in the basement. And, fill it, and everyone's getting these foamy ass cups filled with foam. And I'm like, oh my God, it works. Like, you tilt the glass and everything. And it was literally just the, I, the only time I ever saw there anyone tell me that was you guys at Grotto. <laughs> Couldn't even drink it. I, you, 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 your whole life is like, you could think your entire life. Like on the weekender and the oh, people you gosh. met there, this is amazing. Yeah, it was. I, was, I, I mean, I got like all the uh, the typical experiences you get from sports, like being on a team. You know, if you're like a young guy in the sport team, you got guys two or three years older that kind of like give you all the advice or whatever. I got that from the weekender instead. Like real life shit. Like I mean, technically, but yeah, it was even better. It wasn't like eighteen year old kids giving a sixteen year old advice about like where to, I don't know, go drink beer in the woods or something. Like it was like <laughs> real shit. I mean, technically, your wife could can thank us and me, me specifically, you specifically, because I mean, had it not been for me, maybe you, you would have, me. maybe Dinner. maybe you would have, uh, you know, <laughs> you still met, two years of college left. <laughs> maybe you would have met somebody your freshman year, and had I not given you that those words of wisdom, you would have been like, okay, this is the one, and you would have never met your wife. Yeah, <laughs> well, tell her that. I feel like, uh, I really do feel like I got that, like I said, I got an internship down here right away and they just like pretty much never let me, I still work there today, pretty much after the summer was over. And that was a formal like summer internship, right? Like interviewed for it and they were like, you're going to work here for the summer and in August when it's done, you go back to school or whatever. Um, and that they were like, do you just want to keep doing this and <laughs> pay me part time? And then the summer would come, I'd work full time again. It was pretty much like I had the weekend or I feel like where they were pretty much just like, you guys pretty much like. If you want to keep doing it, great. And they were like, if you want, to, if you can pull it off, it's cool. Like, yeah, let's uh, let's keep going. And I don't think they would have done that had that been my first real work experience. But it felt like I was three years ahead of the game, basically. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, sessions at Harvey's Lake. I, who was the band? Strand of Oaks, a Philly band too. Philly yes, guys. Strand of Oaks. That was probably the the coolest one that we did of those. I remember not being a fan of the music necessarily, which is. Also, I have some funny stuff about that, I guess. Uh, 
but yeah, I remember that was one of my first times really at Barbie's Lake and be like, well, this is awesome. I remember we did like weekend or deck games or party deck games or something at that grotto a couple of times after being really excited because I was like right on the lake and whatever. But I, uh, Lelo was big, like, you know, jam bag guy. I feel like a lot of the stuff he covered would be, I remember Jackie Green was coming to the jazz cafe and him freaking out, put him on the cover. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? Am I supposed to know who this is? Now I'm like, I went to the dead. I want to, I remember going to the bog for Lelo's high weighty one event. And somebody there was like talking to me and like, I had to leave when the real thing stood. Like I was there for like the pre-party or something, but then when the band started playing or something, I had to leave because I wasn't 21. I remember somebody might've been Finnerty. I don't know. Someone was asking questions. They're like, they're like, what kind of music do you like? And I was like, Blink-182, like punk, pop punk stuff. And they're like, you're going to be a bog guy by the time you're older. <laughs> I'm like, they're totally right. Now I can't listen to any of that stuff. I'm all into like the dad, Bob Dylan, like all those bog bands, I feel like jam band stuff. Uh, so it's kind of funny how I came around as a, with age. Yeah, you were in love with Blink-182 and Yellow Card. I mean, who was it at 16, 17? Dude, yeah. I still like those bands. I'm not going to lie. Actually, that's why my wife and I kind of, I remember we were at a bar uh, the first night we met and I remember like her asking, like, what's your favorite music thing? And I'm like, not going to lie. I'm like kind of into like this new stuff, like, but Blink-182 is probably my favorite. Her being like mine too. And like, that's, she honestly says like, that's why she kept talking to me. <laughs> you're lucky. You're lucky, Marcus. Every, every once in a while, we throw it on with a throwback. But you're lucky. You're lucky. You stayed true. Yeah. To your roots. Um, How'd you guys meet? Just school? Yeah, we were, uh trying to remember now like common mutual friend like had a birthday so we're both there and uh the whole like group of people like 10 15 people were gonna go downtown to a bar and we both just snuck off and went to a campus bar ourselves uh and then we we saw each other like every night after that for like a week so that's how i knew i had it had a band <laughs> and you called me up and said john i got a bat yeah what do i do is it okay is it is it okay is it time? It, it was like very weird because we just pretty much started dating without officially like every night. It's like, you want to go to the bar and get a drink? Yeah, why not? It's like, holy shit. Uh, it was 21, but it was like to be drinking like every night out of the bar. It was like something, something new. That's when you do it, man. That's when you do it. I was thinking back. We used to do this thing called $2 Tuesdays. Uh, we had like this bar had 37, 38 craft beers. That was another thing. It's like I got into beers basically because you guys were brewing your own. So I yeah. the cheap Coors Light, lager, or whatever. And I'm always like, I think I should get into beer. I feel like people that are older get into beer. Uh, so I would always try to crack. Basically, my strategy at that time, especially on $2 Tuesday, when all 38 beers were $2, I just go for the highest 9%, 11%, just to get the drunkest. Get blackout, yeah. <laughs> and then like, I get the ones that tasted like the IPA that tasted like pine needles, I would call yeah. it. And, uh, <laughs> so I just try to go from <laughs> down. But then eventually, like I got into it. Now I'm like pretty much only drink IPAs. Uh, I actually, I want to look into brewing my own thing. I haven't really looked into it. Uh, have you done that lately? No, me and Matt, I think the last time we did that was 2000, oh, 10 or 11. Man, I think he's, well, I think he's still, he, he's done it since then. Um, he was like on a farm now and like, he's got like all the space to do shit like that. And that's so funny. That you remember that. That's, that's you, great. Like, you ferment it. How long do you do that? I think, yeah, I think they did it for like 30 days. Oh wow, wow! Yeah, I'm always or longer. Talking. But yeah, I told you, I listened to a uh, podcast on fermenting, so I got my rotten vegetables here. <laughs> well, the problem is like the beer that we we would make all this beer, right? So it was really it was a lot of fun. Like we hung out. We were you know at one point we went from because Matt used to live with AJ, so he had, we did like a <clears throat> we did some stuff outside, and then we kept it in the basement of their apartment complex. And then I think he moved out of there. So like we had the stuff on the back deck of my house um, and then in my basement. But um, it's like, it's not, the, the yield isn't worth like the time you spend. You know, it's like you do all this work. And, and it, again, it's a great time with your friends and you're hanging out. It's, you make, make a Saturday out of it. But again, you get, you get older and like your time to do like things is limited. And it's like, well, you know what? I'd rather just fucking pay for it. Yeah. Especially when you have so many good options these days. Yeah. Uh, like almost yeah. too many. I got like the, you know, the fermentation book. And uh, that's actually the first chapter before vegetables or anything. Like, try brewing your own beer. I'm like, it seems ambitious for your first project. But it's like a popcorn did it. Maybe I can pull it off. Oh, it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's that. Philly's awesome for beer. Uh, we one of our first trips together was to DC. I remember going to a bar in DC down there, one of the first bars outside of Philly I went to, and they had one beer on tap. It was like Modelo or something. I was like, holy shit, I got to drink like rum or something now. Uh, couldn't believe it. So we go to breweries all the time around here. Definitely take advantage of this being a beer city. Uh, I don't know. I feel like well, again, another another weekend of trade. I feel like I wouldn't have gotten a beer if it wasn't wasn't exposed to it there. I love the fact that you're at a party. You're like, what the fuck? This is your first your first beer? This is your first time you pour a beer in just so I can come in and tilt it and look like a rock star. The other the other tip, I guess, that uh this was not taught by you, but I learned was that uh if you just yell house cup, no one actually verifies if you live at the place or not, and they just let you through and skip the line and fill up your cup. That's funny. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> Morgus, I mean, I feel like if it wasn't for the weekender, you would not be where you are today. No, I wouldn't. No, no, no. So you, know, I mean, you guys are the only ones that really gave me a chance to keep going. Uh, I would say because I remember, like I said, I emailed ninety-seven nine X, emailed some recording studios. No one had any any part-time jobs for an ambitious high school kid. But you guys, and again, I was like, I worked at Odyssey Fitness to get my my actual gas money and stuff. Uh, so I was pretty much doing it for fun, knowing like hoping that putting the time would lead to other stuff, would lead to networking, lead to a job. Uh, but it was cool to have an opportunity to like do all that stuff. You know, like I said, I was doing events, sales, writing, like all that stuff, pretty much whatever I was interested in. There was some type of avenue to work on it. Well, real quick, Morgus, you mentioned the Odyssey Fitness. You met the uncle of my favorite musician. Oh, that's right. He worked out there. Pete Yorn. I actually tweeted at Pete Yorn. Uh, and he actually, he wrote back or re- replied back or retweeted or, or whatever the hell you do on Twitter. I don't fucking forgot you were involved. being Pete Yeah. Yeah. He, he actually responded to me, but yeah. So, uh, yeah. Pete Yorn's uncle, I guess lives in mountaintop. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Jerry Yorn, the guy's name was oh, what's his name. Jerry Yorn. Jerry uh, Yorn. Yeah. He was a, he was a regular. He sometimes would come twice a day. He was like dedicated Good for him. But Speaking of dedicate, and I, I joke around like, you know, you are where you are today because of the weekender. You are where you are today because of who you are and, and your work ethic and, and all that kind of stuff. Like, they're, they're, you're a very rare breed. There's not many. I, you might be the only one that I've ever, <laughs> ever heard of that is, you know, 16, 17 years old and just like throwing themselves into uh, an internship and, you know, an unpaid internship and just kind of, you know, learning the ropes. And obviously you doing that has paid off uh, for you. So, I mean, while we were, I think, hopefully good uh, teachers and, and a good guidance, I mean, y- you made it what it was. So, I mean, okay. I, I joke around about, you know, the weekend are doing it for you, but it was definitely you doing it for you. So. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I think it was really just fear of, uh, oh, damn, you got to actually figure out what you want to do in life. Well, it, it's a shame that, I mean, I, I'm I'm still like, I didn't know that before about, you know, your your teacher kind of telling you to do that. I mean, I think that's great because, I mean, our brains don't even fully develop until we're, what, we're 25. Like, how can you figure out at 18 what you're going to do for the rest of your life? And I mean, like I said, it worked because like that's that 92% change. I mean, I went in trying to do general communications and ended with computer science uh so i did change but like use all that prior work like didn't just go to waste in any sense yeah um yeah uh it was cool too just being like i remember actually uh one thing that kind of scared me about the industry was sophia from wnep now, this was like again 10 years ago i don't know if she's still there um she when i was doing go like a lot of stuff she would be there for wnep covering a lot of things I remember asking her, being like, I think I'm going to be going to Philly for college. Uh, how's that market different than like somewhere up here? And she was like, oh my gosh. She's like, I try to get into many markets and the only one I could get to is here. And she told me like where Scranton, Wilkes-Barre is, you know, it's like market 100 and something, you know, in the country. And she's like, Philadelphia is like four, three or four. She's like, she's, she kind of warned me. She's like, all your experience here is like going to be great. But she's like, it may not mean much down there. And I was like, oh, shit. She's like, you might be going up against someone who did two or three internships throughout college at like some Philly company or something. And I was like, oh, boy. So I was like very nervous when I went down there that I was like starting from like zero again. That was not, didn't end up being the case. There was a lot of called transferable skills. Right. That's awesome. Well, I'm really happy for you. I'm really, uh, I'm proud of you. 
Um, I'm proud that you took my lessons or our lessons uh, <clears throat> and apply them to your life. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I did have one question for you. So I know you've been on this uh, kick about the weekend. You're like, oh, it's been the Bible, right? Do you get the sense that if it, do you think it would work today? Not in a print form. Definitely not. I mean, <clears throat> that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Why not? I mean, I know it, it wouldn't work in a, a print form just because right. like, that's not how people consume, especially people who are, you know, of the age that you're at the target market, you know, that. And of course, 20, I mean, non-COVID times, like. Well, that too. Yeah. I mean, shit. I mean, can you imagine that even like if we were. You know, if it was back in 2005 and the world shut down, like I couldn't imagine. But I mean, the thing about the weekender was, and I said this before, you know, they wanted to push us into a, a digital direction and online. And, and and I think that's how, you know, Sessions was kind of born. And, you know, Mike and Nikki were doing, uh, you know, videos called uh the weekly dose and rachel and the marketing side was in you know i was including that too we were doing party favors where we would talk about you know there's a video component of of the print product talking about what was going on you know that weekend and where to go who to see zero dollar budget right yeah zero, it, there's no budget it's like go do this and it's like okay so i mean i think we did the best that we could with you know what we had but i mean it that I mean, the weekender in general who never had a budget for anything, even <laughs> when you know it was profitable. Like, but that's 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 the that's how this industry is. Like, you know, print and and even even like radio and shit like that. Like, right. And from what I've experienced, I like, I could be wrong, but from my experience, they just don't know how to utilize and move forward with what they have and build upon it and, and put money to it. So like, I mean, stations will flip formats because, Oh, well, this isn't working. We need to change the format because we're not, we're not, we don't have the listenership or whatever it might be. Well, how did you, how do you reach your listeners outside of having a radio station? Like how do you market yourselves? Because there's so many times that these, these uh, media companies who are, you know, they, they, they tell, you know, let's say Matt Morgus, you have uh a website development firm. Well, how do you tell people about your, your business, Matt? You need to advertise. You got to put your ad in the paper. You got to put it on the radio. You got to put it on billboards. You got to do this. You got to do that. But if you turn that question around on them and said, well, you know, Mr. Radio station, how do you reach new listeners? How do you, how do you do, how do you do that? Where, where do you advertise? Whoa, 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 no, no. Don't get crazy. Matt Morgan. Like, <laughs> we don't know how to do that. We don't, we don't do that. We don't spend our own money. Are you kidding me? I was going to ask that. It probably made you pretty resourceful for this, right? I imagine you have a scrappy budget for your kicking this project off. And uh, yeah, zero. You got to be super cool. I mean, that's good. my own, you know, doing the freelance websites and stuff. That's what I did. I put, I think, $200 in a bank account and started. I was like, all right, I'm putting no more of my own money in. Make, like, you know, build websites, get the money, save it, et cetera. Uh, and I feel like all that, again, came from weekend or having no budget trying to do this stuff. I'm mean, trying to do weekend or sessions and stuff. Just even buy pizza for the bands was hard. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's. I feel weird too because like, I've I've been built to to do that, like to cut corners and and which is I think it's good, but it's also bad because it it makes me feel, sometimes feel cheap. It makes me wonder. So this is a uh, like I I did this meetup like cup before COVID. Uh, I was trying to do like a monthly. This also probably should camp for the weekend or stuff. I was like, it'd be cool if we did a monthly tech meetup at the the office. We have this cool tech office. We're always talking about. Just like you said, how can we get the word out about us, right? It's hard to recruit and hire in tech. Uh, so then what do we do a meetup where we have like some interesting talks uh, each month? We supply food and just bring a bunch of those people here if they can see the office, et cetera. And like, just, I don't know, at least get the name out. And the company's like, sure, here's like 300 bucks to use every month. And let us know if you need more. Buy a P, you know, rent a PA system, buy beer, buy, get it catered, et cetera. And I was like, holy oh, smokes. I'm like, if the weekender just gave us two, 300 bucks, like, Two, three hundred bucks made all the difference of that being a scrappy event that could work and was thrown together versus like, wow, I could just ask someone, hey, here's some money or how much does this cost? Let me pay you to do this and it gets done right. I was like, damn, if we had sessions or anything with even 250 a month or something, like it could, it was already, I feel like, really good. I don't want to like 
put down everything we did because I'm really proud of it still to this day. Uh, You're right. If we just had a little bit of support, oh God. <laughs> yeah. And I, I would feel badly if I didn't like <clears throat> you mentioned this project and I had to thank, you know, Keith Perks uh, did my logo design for this, this whole thing. So shout out to him. He did a great job. And um, I was going to say, I think that's why so many of us stayed friends and stuff. Cause we had a band together and like, yeah, real, not bargain and trade, but like, you know, there was a lot of that going on. Hey, yeah. I'll, I'll scratch your back and scratch mine. And then you kind of made those connections and relationships. And it was more than just, you know, like down, like again, everyone I build, even people I build websites with now, strictly business like they're paying me money if they stop paying me i don't care and like if they if i stop delivering for them they have no problem dropping me for someone else uh where with all the business and stuff we kind of did up there i feel like it was much more personal much yeah. more like, connection well you know in any pa we, we take care of our own and you know shout out to justin from ionic development who helps me uh with the hosting of this the podcast and um making this sound the best it can, you know, since it's via zoom. So we lose a b- little bit of the audio quality and he helps me make it the best it can. So thank you to him. But yeah, I mean, um, Oh, and, and Joey Z from, uh, I don't know if you came across Joey Z, uh, but he was like a, an intern for us too at the weekender, but he, uh, built the website for me. Uh, so thank you to him. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, I felt so like weird, but I mean, they also came to me and said, how, how can we help too? So I mean, as much as I asked them for help, they, they, they also asked how they could help. So, but yeah, you're right. It's just like you learn how to be resourceful, I guess you could say is a good word, but it's also sucks because you're like, I have no money. Well, yeah, but I mean, anyone start, you know, I'm starting, if you start your own thing, I think that's expected, but the weekend you'd assume has, (laughs) <laughs> they had, yeah. I mean, they had a couple bucks to play with. Exactly. Especially, I mean, if that's the direction they want to go in, too, it's like... That's what I'm saying. Yeah, is if that's what they wanted to push, and it was... I feel like we proved it to be successful, and maybe not. This is what I heard Mike talk about. Sessions, I guess, never technically made a dollar. So maybe maybe it wasn't successful in their eyes in that sense. One thing I've learned over the years was to start really thinking commercially, too, right? Everyone's got to make money in some sense, so... Right. But also, I mean, like, they weren't losing money on that. I mean, right. They, gaining exposure they were gaining like you know probably readers and viewers like i don't know and that's you know going back to media companies in this market especially like they they just <clears throat> they're not good at promoting themselves like well we will we put an ad this is my favorite thing you know um let's, let's just say it's the weekender it's like well we put an ad about the weekender in the weekender that's, uh, but that's what we did. That's how we advertised it. And it's like, but you already, like, the readers are already there. You have those. How are you reaching new people? Yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. Well, we don't. What, what are you crazy? We, we, that'll cost money. Yeah. Like, we don't want to do that. Like, we put an ad in the weekender. It's like, but it, it just blows my mind. Like, same with radio stations and shit like that. It's like, you know, there's one station that, you know, has or is owned by a print company as well. Well, we so, put an ad in the paper. We put an ad on the air. I think, uh, did you have the person who started the weekend around, right? Yes. Uh, and I feel like, did he mention something about like, if you did it today, you'd have to be very event-based. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think that would probably be the way it goes. Uh, I remember one of the stories I was working on there, tried to work. This was like my one bit into like real journalistic stuff that didn't come from Go Like a Because Go Like a I had to do some real like, not to get, uh, not to get off topic here. I want to remember what I was going uh, about to say, but go like a lot. I remember getting a couple of stories from Chris where he's like, call this person, call this person. I call them basically would hang up on me or something. It's like, great. Call their boss now. Or like call this person. Like he would have you dig. And I learned that's really what like journalism is. Is like when you ask a band or a publicist for an interview, like they're happy to give it to you. That was a very easy exchange, right? Especially if they're touring and promoting something like it pretty much was like, two sentence email, they go, yes, here's the time. You have 10 minutes on the phone with them, go. When you're trying to dig up a story about someone who spray painted something or a court case or something, they're not willingly giving this info. And you got to like call their family and friends and really try to dig for some of the stuff. And I was like, oh, this is a little more uncomfortable. And I remember trying to do a story, this is how I type back. Uh, and remember, I was going to say, I remember trying to do a story for Lelo that I pitched to him about like, why do cover bands make so much more money than original artists? <laughs> I don't know if you remember me digging. And I remember asking all these bands and they're like, da, 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 da. I'm like, great. I'm working on a story about this. Can I like quote you with some of this stuff? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Cannot put my name or use my stuff at all. And I was like, oh, shit. 
because I remember it was mind boggling uh, feeling like a lot of these artists, like, I don't know if it was just cool to me because I was around people that created music. I feel like I never would be able to do myself uh, or if I felt like oh, they were actually good or some combination of both. But I was just like, we have all these bands around here making original music. How come they can't play it? Every time they're playing, it's always just a million cover songs and they maybe work in one of their originals, but most of the time never. I was blown away that that was the case. Uh, and I tried to do a story on it and get to like kind of get to the bottom of it. Never did. Um, I mean, I don't want to like throw out any hot takes or anything here, but like, why do people just not give a shit? Uh, like, you think it, like, it seems so weird. Like, anytime there's any new original stuff, it seems just not to like hit with the audience as much as, as the covers. Yeah. So people, I mean, what I think it is people, people like to, people like familiarity. They want to hear songs that they know and that they can sing to and all that kind of stuff. Whereas, you know, a local musician who's doing their own stuff, like they don't know it. They don't know how to appreciate it. Like, I guess that's what would blow my mind. Cause I'm like, I would love to listen to the new, you know, like Miz was one of my favorites because I was a big guitar guy. So like, Miz yeah. was my thing. I would listen to all those songs uh, and learn them so that I would be interested to go see him. And like, oftentimes I go see him and he'd play cover songs and stuff. I'm like, oh, God damn. I didn't know. You know, it was like always hard to find his original gigs or something. Uh, you're really going to sneak him out. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, people, especially like, you know, on a Friday, Saturday night, people are, they, they want to, you know, unwind after a long week. They want to, they want to dance and they want to sing and and how do you do that it's it's with songs that you know and it's it's stuff that you that yeah. you're familiar with so it's like it's and i mean so is it still my question basically is going to be like is it still like that because this was again 10 years ago so has it flipped a little bit because there's a lot of local a lot of focus on local music with between like what you were doing like with your old show and now this obviously other stations were we're doing local music stuff so it seems like there's more of a focus on it now than Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think um so a lot of things have happened. Like, you know, back in like 2008, 9, 10, um there was a, a little bit of a shift in the entertainment world. You know, a lot of venues A they closed and B they didn't want to pay full bands cuz they couldn't afford to. So they started playing or they started paying DJs. Um and I feel like, you know, the last 3 or 4 years this area specifically has kind of, um, well, started to make a comeback. There was, there was venues that, you know, focused on original material that opened their doors to, to artists that, you know, played original songs. And there was, you know, the radio, st- the radio show that I had, you know, nine seven nine X had one. Um, the river had one, has one, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, you know, rich from any PA scene, you know, it's a big focus on local music. I mean, it was just always, and, and also too, I don't want to forget the fact that a lot of musicians today support each other. So it's, it's more of a community effort than, you know, back in like 2005, six, seven, you know, if you were a, a original local band, like you were, it was cutthroat. Like you, they didn't get along. Like they were like, we're better than you we're going to be the next one, you know, signed out of the area. And that's kind of all there was to it. But these days there's a lot of collaborations. There's artists working together on songs. Um, it's just a different, different time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, that was something interesting. Cause I saw these bands. Like I remember when I was looking at the job shadow stuff, uh, and I found a lot of these bands, which led me the weekend during 97, nine and all that for the job shadowing. Uh, they all had like original songs, you know, their MySpace and their autoplay and it was like their own thing. And then you saw their schedule and it was always, you know, 10 at night or whatever. So I was never able to go and 21 plus. And I just assumed they were always playing those original songs. So when I actually got in, like from working the internship and stuff and saw that they were all covers, and I was like, whoa, my whole perception was like kind of turned upside down. Uh, I don't know. And then I realized like, oh, okay. So this isn't the scene I thought it was with a bunch of like creative musicians all play their own stuff <laughs> like they're doing that sort of but when they play their gigs yeah well that was also i mean they would play those gigs to help fund their yeah, that's what I'm saying. yeah they had to play those gigs to get the money to then pay for the studio time etc and i was just like wow this is just not you know my original perception of it is just not the case i guess uh, yeah. yeah another like don't meet your heroes moment i guess like i thought like it was yeah i was like a high school kid 
looking online, seeing like all these MySpace pages, thinking it was this whole big scene, and then you get into it, it's a little different. It's like, oh, but it all comes down to like money, really, too, right? Like if that was what was paying the bills, you can't really blame a band for taking a five k check to play Night of Covers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 funny how you you talk about perception, and it's it's funny how you know when you're young and you you think about things and oh, this band's on the radio, they must be rolling, and you see them they're they're pumping a van, and <clears throat> it's just amazing. Like I don't know until you like you kind of are in it, you don't understand how the sausage is made, you know. Yeah, I think one thing I learned too is that no matter how, even down here in Philly, when you really get into a field or like any type of like, doesn't even have to be a niche, you realize everyone in that industry, whatever, knows each other. Like, I don't know. Like in yeah, those days, like if someone was promoting a concert, you probably knew who it was. And I feel like even down here, it's only a handful of people really in that business doing that stuff. Uh, so you kind of learned like quickly, like you don't really want to burn many bridges because you're going to be, everyone knows each other. And like, even if you burn one bridge, that person's going to talk to someone else and like, you might have a bad time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, perceptions is crazy. I remember when I was changed my major my freshman year, all I wanted to do is work for Google or Facebook. And now it's like the last place I'd freaking work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're like, oh yeah, they, they have daycare there. They do your laundry. I'm like, that sounds awesome. I'm like, oh, that's because they never want you to leave. Right. <laughs> they're just trying to trap you there. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I don't know. That was, uh, I feel like you guys definitely helped me grow up for sure. Well, I'm glad we could, uh, much quicker be part of that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was, uh, like I said, you guys were all like big brothers, big sisters. Um, and I knew, I knew when I went down to college too, uh, but I could always reach out, uh, if anything, you know, if I ever needed anything, which was really cool, you know, to get developed. Well, Morgus, if you ever need an old man's advice, you know where to find me. Yep. <laughs> we should do it on the podcast. <laughs> Advice with Popco. Yeah. So, what's your what's the the plan for the pod? You're doing these weekend files, and then uh, I know you're interviewing a bunch of local bands, but yeah, I mean, it's on one thing, right? So you're kind of just trying to go. So, you know, the, the reason I created it was because <clears throat> my radio show that I had got, you know, they keep saying well, they said it was on hiatus. Um. To me, that meant canceled. And I always thought that I'd get canceled because I did something wrong. <laughs> but I feel like I, you know, in the three years that I had that radio, well, over three years that I had that radio show, I did more advertising and promotion for that station for zero dollars than they did for themselves in like 10 years. So, you know, <clears throat> there was that. And I, I feel like I built, I built something for that long, you know, for them to throw it away. Right. And not have a real plan to like, you know, move it forward because I still think it had a place, you know, in, in that cluster of, of radio stations, but it is what it is. Um, and then I look back and at my time at the weekender and the reason that that came to an end was by no fault of my own, you know, new ownership, you know, change of, you know, change of the times and how people consume media and, and entertainment and and all that kind of stuff. But again, that ended because, I mean, I left the weekend on my own, but I mean, I left for a reason, but again, it was something I was, I, you know, I live, breathe every day. I keep saying to this day, I, I, at one point I would have got a a tattoo of the weekend or logo on my body because that's how in love and, and proud I was of, of being there. But that ended. And I said, I'm tired of building something for other people. Yeah. And I still want to have a platform for, um, you know, specifically local music and musicians in this area to use as, you know, a, a way to get their you know music out and you know how they kind of started and where they plan on going. And, but I don't want to like, you know, pitch my whole pigeonhole myself just for local musicians. I want to, you know, open that up to local business owners or, um, you know, artists that are, you know, tattoo artists or barbers or or anything like that. But I also don't want to limit it to just NAPA. I mean, I think that's the the focus, but I mean, the internet is, as you know, we talk about uh, worldwide. (laughs) WWW dot, but, um, pop go project. So I guess one thing I was going to ask is, uh, I'm sure the, I think I know the answer. The answer is going to be yes. Like, do you feel you could reach more people 
been on the radio show with this. Yes. Yeah, right. And I hope to. Obviously, if you said no, there'd be something wrong. <laughs> but, I mean, it's pretty cool because, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I guess I'd imagine it's scary in some sense because you're totally in control of it. So, if it doesn't quite hit, hit the, reach the height that you want it to, right, then you have no one to blame but yourself. But at the same time, if it does, like, you have no one to blame but yourself, which is a good Yeah, thing. And, and also, like, I mean, you know, when we, when I talk to you about doing this, you're like, oh, I don't know if people will watch or, or listen. And it's like, to an, to an extent, like I'm not, I'm not doing this to pay my bills. I'm doing this to create something that, you know, for me and to have a documentation of, you know, the life that I've lived and, and, um, you know, hopefully you get something out of it as well. But I mean, if it goes somewhere, great. You know, I mean, ideally I'd love to have, you know, a studio where I could sit one-on-one face-to-face with somebody. And I've had offers from people, but like, you know, we're still in a, a, a world that doesn't encourage, you know, that kind of life. Um, so I, I, and I appreciate those offers, but you know, right now I just don't feel like that's the the right, the right move. Plus, I mean, we could zoom in people in those studios like we're doing now, but I think having a studio, you're kind of limited to like, you know, planning stuff out really far in advance and, this allows me to be very flexible. And, you know, I, I just did a thing and next, the band is in Philly. It's a band called cuddle drug. Um, I, I found out about their stuff like on a Sunday and I did a podcast with them on uh, a Tuesday and they were releasing, they were doing a live stream on a Saturday and releasing an album. And, you know, any money raised from that album was going to go towards the national suicide prevention lifeline. Uh, so that happened quick. I found out on Sunday did it on on Tuesday to promote the event on Saturday. So I wouldn't have that kind of flexibility in that all that if I had a studio. So I mean this is cool too. But from an audio standpoint, it's not the best. <laughs> but I mean they've been mine's probably gonna be a lot worse than yours. Yours sound really good with the mic. Uh yeah, I don't know. You uh I think it's cool because uh you have the flexibility to kind of be uncensored and like go in any direction you want. You don't have to like like you said pigeonhole the one thing. Um, but you get different people's stories. Like I know you're not, you're not trying to copy Rogan, but that's one of the cool things is like he'll have some PhD scientist on, then he has a mushroom hunter on, and then a UFC fighter. Uh, so you can kind of kind of go in and out, and it's cool to oh, see someone I know doing that stuff. You know, pushing the forward. Cool. Well, I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, I was gonna say, not that you need any recommendations from me, uh, but it'd be really cool to see. Uh, I don't know, like John. You know John Thurman? Who? John Fetterman from a Switchfoot? No, no. Uh, he's our he's Pennsylvania's lieutenant governor. He's oh, a, oh yeah. Run up for U.S. Senate. Got sleeves of tattoos. Yes. He's hanging a weed flag from the cat from his balcony at the Harrisburg Capitol. Big advocate for marijuana. Um, yeah, he would be he'd be an awesome guest. I feel like, uh, and I feel like he'd be like my mind for the weekend. Is like he's promoting himself now because he just. Do you have a connection? <laughs> so <laughs> this is where I was getting. And again, this is like. You know, beer deep, deep in the podcast here. Uh, the guy that Tara went to school with, Tara's a social worker. Um, and a guy that she went to school with also just announced, he's a state rep from Philly, just announced a Senate thing. And I was like, damn, it'd be awesome to have like a Fetterman on the podcast and then hear that guy on the podcast. Because we're like, who the hell are we going to vote for? We, like, she really supports that guy. She's a big Fetterman guy. Now she's torn. She's like, oh, no, I have to pick one. Uh, and like, as we're talking to him, like, Papa would be awesome to have him talk to each one of them for an hour and just hear those, you know, candidates just talk for real instead of this town, you know, the can town hall questions that they answer. Yeah. Like, I remember hearing the politicians on Rogan and just being like, oh, this is awesome. Like, you hear so much of like their real thoughts on stuff and their explanations and, and stuff. Well, that's, I, I mean, that's, you know, if you had a radio show or even like uh, an article in the newspaper, like, you just, you don't have an infinite amount of, time or space so it's like you know they it's the cookie cutter stuff it's like you know it, from, from a band standpoint it's you know how do you start how do you get the name where's your next show it's all this boring bullshit that i mean like is important but like yeah it's not it's not a, it's not entertaining it's not informative it's just like it's like uh oh yeah um, so and so's doing a tour and they have to they have to make the stops and they're talking to this this guy and that guy several album or several articles i get awesome quotes but because you only have 400 or 500 words and you got to treat each article as if no one's heard of the band before, you got to right. put all that bullshit in. And by the time you get to the end, you can't get any interesting stuff. So yeah, this form is really cool. And 
typically the ones at least I listen to are all like, you know, big national level. So they don't have people on, you know, like, as you said, local business owners and stuff going through what they're going through now and talking about it at that level. So, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I'm excited to see where you're, where you're taking. I know you're only a few months in. Yeah, so this will be, I think I just posted episode 21 today. So yeah, you're cool. know, we'll see what happens. I have uh, one guy, one podcast I listen to down here. Uh, the, he's also the program director for a Philly radio station. He said you don't have a podcast until you have at least 100 episodes. So, 100? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 70 percent more to go if you live by that rule. So 20% uh, there. But yeah, he said he said you, you don't really have a podcast. You don't really know what your podcast is or something like that uh, until you had 100 episodes. So I, I could, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Best of luck. I hope you hit 100 soon. So, I hope so too. It'd be very funny because you said you were going back to listen to the Rogan ones. Uh, it's going to be funny coming back and listening to these when you actually do have a studio and stuff. And you're like, oh, wow, we were zooming in COVID times. We didn't have a mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully it gets to that point, but we'll see. But thanks for being a part of it. I do appreciate it. And I, again, um, I'm like a proud big brother. Yeah, you, yeah thanks, man. Uh, so, uh, I appreciate you having me on. Like I said, I think only, uh, I'll find out if even my mother listens to this, but it's a good little time capsule to have. Like you said. Absolutely. Like, yeah. about it. Once you brought that up, I was like, okay, I'm on board. Yeah. So, uh, tell Tara, I said, hello and, uh, best of luck with you guys, you know, finding out where you want to live and have a wedding. wedding plans and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Thanks man. If you uh, need, if you need advice that, uh, may be the wrong advice, I'll still be happy to give it to you. Yep. Yeah. Appreciate <laughs> it. All right, man. Take care and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks, man. All right, thanks. See ya.